Good morning, church. My name is Kendall. Our scripture from this morning will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him with all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. This is the word of the Lord. All right, we got a lot to do today. I want to begin this morning by giving you an update on our trip to Madrid. I, I promised that this was coming last week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Brittany and I traveled with Antonio and Daniela Correa. Uh, as you know, Antonio is the pastor of the church we've been supporting in Guinare, Venezuela. He planted that church a little over 10 years ago with a couple of his friends and family members. That church in Venezuela ha has grown. It has thrived. They've actually launched another campus in another city. Uh, but about a year ago, God began to lay on his heart. Um, he's seen all of these people leave Venezuela and move to Madrid. Uh, it's, you know, Venezuela, things are very difficult. And uh, he was hearing more and more from friends and family, like, we really wish that we had a church here in Madrid. And Antonio loves his country, loves his people. And he said he would never want to uh, go to Madrid and, and, and invest there, except that God has led him to do so. And so, uh, several months ago, we really began to pray about what our role would be in that. Uh, Antonio approached us and said, hey, would you be our sending church? Would you be the one who helps fund us to get there? Obviously, Venezuela, they're very impoverished. They don't have money to send anyone anywhere. And so we end up going to Madrid, and our, our trip kind of had three uh, main focuses, if you will. Uh, the first was to figure out what does it look like to plant a church in Madrid. And so we partnered with uh, an organization called the Upstream Collective, and it's an organization of former missionaries. Uh, the guy that we met with, his name was Larry McCreary. Uh, he's been in Madrid for about 20 years. And so they were teaching us, what does it look like to preach the gospel to Spanish people? What does church look like in this culture? I don't know if you've ever gone somewhere other than here and done church. I remember being in church in Haiti, and uh, we all stood in the circle and we worshiped. And y'all, they danced. I mean, they get after it in their worship. And I'm like a white boy, like, is this all right? You know, I thought we weren't supposed to dance. So uh, church looks different in different places, in different cultures, worship in different ways. And so uh, they kind of walked us through. We met with various church planners and missionaries on the field there. We were actually sitting in a meeting uh, with a gentleman in one of the areas of the city. Um, and this, the, the Larry, the upstream collective guy, had connected us with this, this man. And he said, hey, he's a Brazilian. Brazilian, and he knows Spanish culture. He actually wrote his doctoral thesis on how to reach Spanish people. And I'm sitting there, and as I'm sitting in the meeting with him, like a light bulb goes off. I remember hearing his name about a guy from Brazil, and I, I, I thought back to an email I'd received from Rhonda Baxter. Y'all may know Rhonda. We've supported her as a missionary for about 20 years uh, from this church. And Rhonda had sent me an email on the flight there, and I didn't really pay attention to it because I was excited about where we were going. We're busy getting through airports, and, but I remembered seeing the name Fernando in her email. And so in the middle of our meeting, I was like, hey, what's your name again? And he was like, Fernando. I was like, what organization are you with? Do you, do you know Rhonda Baxter? And he was like, 
Oh my goodness, are you Jason? He was like, because I got a text message from Rhonda Baxter and said that if at all possible, we needed to get together while you were here in this city so that I could help you guys in your church plan. And so, you know, God uh, very providentially brought people into our path. We connected, uh, like I said, with church planners and missionaries and people that were extraordinarily helpful in training Antonio and Daniela and what it looks like to plant a church there. Uh, but the second piece of what we were doing is we were learning what it looks like to be ascending church. What does it look like for us to be uh, active here in sending people to places that most of us won't go? Uh, as Brittany and I were there, I'm like, you know, Brittany, I don't feel called to come here and serve as a missionary. You always kind of worry. You know, you go on a trip, like, am I going to have to go over there? I was like, I don't feel called to go and live in Madrid and, and to be a missionary there. Uh, but I do feel called to support the work that's being done. And so there's a lot of finances that have to be raised. There's a heck of a lot of prayer that needs to go into that church plant. There's a lot of support and care that those missionaries need. I mean, imagine leaving everything that you know, your friends and your family, all of your customs, your favorite grocery store, your amenities of life, and going to a place where everything is different. And then having no contact with your friends or your family because there's a time gap and people tend to forget about you. And one of the things that the Upstream Collective really emphasizes is the need to care for missionaries. They talk about orphan missionaries whose churches forget them and no longer encourage or pray for or support them. And so what we wanted to do is learn what does it look like for us to be a sending church and how do we care for them well while we're there. And it was really, it was really, really excellent. Uh, provided a lot of clarity for us and what our role will be, uh, how we need to support them over the next few years. And so really blessed there. And then the third thing that we went for was to go to encourage support a couple of missionaries that we have in South Africa. I'm sorry, Northern Africa, not South Africa. Uh, and I, I say South Afri Africa, and I'm not going to give you their names. If you want to know who they are, they're on the screens in the coffee bar. But I can't use their names or even talk about the place because they serve in a place where it is extremely difficult for Christian missionaries to be. Uh, it's illegal to own a Bible. It's illegal to share the gospel. They live under Sharia law in their country, and they've been there about six years, and we've just been faithfully supporting them financially, but they've never had a visit from our church. And, y'all, we weren't there very long in that country, but just an opportunity to sit and to pray, and for us to pray with them, and for them to know that our church is behind them and supporting them in the work that they're doing there. It was a profound uh, time that we got to spend together with them. And so thank you uh, for sending us. It was a whirlwind of a trip, uh, but God is at work. The plan for us as of, as of right now is for Antonio and Dan Daniela to move to Madrid in June or July. Uh, they've gathered a core team of about 30 people. I think I have the picture up here on the screen. We gathered with them. Y'all, there were 28 people in a little bitty apartment, and it didn't bother them at all. But again, we're kind of white bread Americans. It was a little uncomfortable. Uh, also, we're dressed differently from everyone who was there. But just worship God together. In that room, there was no like keyboard or guitar. It was just voices. And uh, man, just a powerful moment we got to have. Uh, the, the Venezuelans that Antonio knows there in Madrid, they're so eager to be a part of a church. Just to give you some demographics, in Madrid, uh, only 2% of the population are Bible-believing Christians. However, um, of that 2%, 70% of those are Latin American transplants who have moved there already being believers. And so when you think about the percentage of the 7 million person population who are evangelical Christians and Spaniards, it's vanishingly small. And so there's much work to do in the city. There aren't churches on every corner by any stretch. Uh, it's a difficult place to serve, but God is at work, and we're just eager to see what he's going to do as they get on the field and to begin their work in that city. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your financial support. Um, man, God's going to do some, some awesome things. So three things that you can do now. Continue to pray. Uh, we're updating our website and our coffee bar so that you guys can see all of the missions endeavors that we're investing in. Uh, I would just ask you to remember those people in prayer. Uh, remember them. Um, 
the couple in North Africa, the birth of their child is happening in about five weeks, and they don't get to have friends and family surrounding them or, or mom to be there to watch the kids when they're gone. You know, they live in a difficult place and they're alone. So be praying for them. Be praying for Antonio and Daniela and their core team. And we have several other missionaries that you can, uh, you can see as you go out to the coffee bar. Those signs are supposed to be here, but they haven't arrived yet. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. The second thing that you can do, um, we've asked you here to commit as a part of your regular living that you would give sacrificially. And I'll just be honest with you, we need about $30,000 to, to finish out sending them to take care of all the needs that we have in our mission budget. And so uh, I'm going to encourage you today just to pray and say, God, how would you have me give in order to help send them and be a part of what God is doing there? And it's not just there. Y'all, we have a couple of college students who are going on a mission trip. Uh, this spring break, they're going to Colorado Springs. They need some help and support. So maybe God would lay that on your heart to give $500 to send one of those two young men who serve faithfully in this body to send them on the trip. Uh, and I also saw this week that uh, Devin Huddleston, who is our missionary uh, in the Edmond, Oklahoma City area who ministers on our college campuses, she's needing to raise monthly support. So I don't know what that looks like for you. If the Holy Spirit would lay it on your heart, I want to encourage you to give sacrificially to each and every one of those things. You can just write their name in the subject line of your check or sending fund or whatever, and we'll make sure it gets where it needs to go. And the third thing I would ask you to pray about is to join our mission sending team. We need people that will be in contact with Antonio and Daniela who will, you know, text them throughout the week and, hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you, who will intentionally connect with them monthly and, and just be able to live life with them to let them know that we're behind them as a church. In particular, if you are a Spanish-speaking lady, we need you. So I don't know who you are, but uh, I want to invite you to be a part of that team. If you're interested, just, just let me know. So if you have other questions about the trip, it was wonderful, uh, blessed in so many ways. God really did move and work. And so again, we're excited to see where this is going to go. All right, I got to change gears now. Uh, today, uh, we're beginning a new series. I, I didn't time this very well, if I'm being honest, but we're beginning a new series called Not Our Normal, and we're going to be looking at the, the book of 1 Corinthians. This is Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, and uh, he's basically writing to say, uh, well, he's having to correct them, to be honest with you. Uh, Corinth was an interesting place. If you've ever read 1 Corinthians, you're going to be like, they wrote to Paul about what? Like, what was going on? They got drunk at communion. I mean, there was all sorts of things going on at the church at Corinth. And so I want to begin today by giving you a little bit of background on how the church started, what the city was like, and then we're going to look in just the, at the first few verses that we have here. Now, if you like to research such things, you like background, you can go back to Acts chapter 18, and you're going to see the beginning of the church at Corinth. The apostle Paul traveled there. He ends up staying at the home of a couple named Priscilla and Aquila, who happened to be tent makers. And so Paul, being a tent maker by trade, was like, hey, I'm going to move in and make tents with you so I can support myself while I'm here in the city. And so Paul did just that. He lived with Priscilla and Aquila for a while. They made tents, and he would do what he did in every city. He would go to the synagogue, and he began to preach the gospel to the Jews. And while a few people were inclined to follow Jesus from the Jewish synagogue, uh, the majority of those, they opposed Paul. They were hostile toward him. And upon concluding that the Jews weren't going to follow Jesus, Paul begins to preach the gospel to the Gentiles of this city. And many, many, many people came to faith in Jesus Christ. Those who had never heard the gospel before, they trust in Jesus. These are, these are non-Jewish uh, people from all sorts of backgrounds and religions. They come to faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul ends up spending about 18 months in the city of Corinth preaching to the people, teaching them what it looks like to follow Jesus Christ. A church was birthed in that city as many, many people came to faith in Christ. Now, after about 18 months, the Jews kind of united against Paul. Um, they wanted to have him thrown in prison. The Roman rulers wouldn't do anything. Um, but Paul exited the city not long after the Jews gathered together. And there was a man named Sosthenes who was the, the head of the synagogue there. And Sosthenes apparently was a bit favorable to Christianity. He might have already converted and become a follower of Jesus. And the Jews in front of the proconsul, they just, they beat him very seriously. 
And so Paul spends a few more days in that city, and then he has to move on. But he wasn't done with the church at Corinth. Um, as a matter of fact, Paul ends up writing not one, not two, but three letters to the church at Corinth. We don't have the first letter that he wrote, but he references, references the letter. He talks about his former letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So just to be a little bit confusing, 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter that Paul wrote to Corinth. It was the second of three. And as you read throughout Acts and other books, we see that Paul actually visited Corinth three more times. And so in terms of Paul's involvement with churches that we see in the scriptures, Corinth was way up there. Three letters, at least three visits. And you think, well, why would Paul? I mean, he had a lot of places that he went, a lot of churches that he planted, a lot of people he'd invested into. Why in the world would he devote so much time and energy and attention to the church at Corinth? And just to be frank with you, it was because the church at Corinth had a tremendous number of issues. They had doctrinal issues. They had issues with division in their church. They were fighting and squabbling and suing each other and hauling one another off to court. And they had issues with the miraculous gifts, like it got ugly at times in their church. They had issues with sexual immorality in their church. A lot going on. And so the Apostle Paul, multiple letters, multiple visits. And, and I'll be honest with you, as I have read 1 Corinthians a lot in the past, as a pastor, I'm like, gosh, I don't know, it seems like Paul would want to throw his hands up and be done with them. Like, like, they got so many issues. It's like, fine, go do your thing. Like, you're so broken. But he continued to be patient and faithful to the church at Corinth, continued to write them letters and to encourage them. And I actually, I came across something that Tim Keller had, had written. And he said there's two kinds of issues that churches have. Um, the first kind of issues that churches will walk through are living church issues. And he basically says that when you are in an, an area and you're doing what God has called you to do, you're, you're not just gathering on Sundays and singing songs and then kind of being done with worship, but when you're living as a church in an area and you're taking the gospel and you're reaching lost people with the good news, right? When, when people are coming to faith and you're bringing them into your church, you're going to have some issues. Because what doesn't happen when we come to faith in Jesus is it's not like we're miraculously transformed in a moment and suddenly we're perfect after that. But rather maturity, it happens over the course of our entire lives. And you, you know what new believers sometimes have? They have some crazy beliefs. And sometimes young and immature believers, they do some things that are not perfectly aligned and obedient to everything that the Word says. It takes time to disciple men and women. What we see, the issues that we see in the church at Corinth are issues that had arisen because they were reaching the lost people of their culture, that they were bringing them into the church and attempting to teach them of what it looked like to be obedient to everything that Jesus had commanded them. But that's not an easy job. It's messy sometimes. The church at Corinth had living church issues rather than dying church issues. That's the other side of the issues a church might face. In a dying church, probably not a ton of division. When in a dying church where, where, where a group of people just gather on a Sunday and it's, hey, preach what I want to hear. We've all been here for a long time. We're not reaching out and, and reaching lost people with the gospel. We're not seeing new people come in. Man, we've all been here for 10 years. We've all been here for 20 years. We've been here for 30 years. We all believe the same things. We vote the same way, right? We, we kind of see the world the same way. Um, dying church issues are not apparent until the end is near. Until suddenly you realize we haven't baptized anyone in a year or two years or three years and, and our church isn't growing, it's actually shrinking. And so uh, to give a little bit of grace to the church at Corinth and hopefully a little bit of grace to us as we as a church struggle, um, we can celebrate the fact that I believe there are some living church issues. There are times in our church where there's some difficulty, where there's conflict, where people don't always believe exactly the same. And those are things that Paul is writing to say, listen, what you see in the culture, the way that you see people living in Corinth, listen, that is not our normal, but rather we can look to the Word of God and see how we as the people of God are supposed to live. Uh, a few remarkable things about the city of Corinth 
It was uh, an interesting city. It had actually been fully destroyed uh, about a hundred years prior to being repopulated by the Roman government as a province. And so the way that they repopulated the city was they sent a bunch of freed slaves there. So slaves from all over the Roman Empire, I mean, different languages and backgrounds and religions, all sorts of stuff, they send them to live in Corinth. And, and it's estimated there were at least 200,000 of these. So it was no small population of freed slaves. And then there were a lot of young people in Corinth. Now, Corinth was strategically situated at kind of the crossroads of two significant trade routes, one that ran north-south and the other that ran east-west. So Corinth was situated on a narrow strip of land. I think I'm going to have it on the screens here for you so you can see between the Ionian and the Aegean seas. And so you see that narrow strip of land, um, because sailing around the peninsula, it took a long time and it was dangerous due to high winds and fierce storms, uh, boats would come on to, and harbor on one side of Corinth and they would offload their cargoes and they would actually haul them five miles and then unload them on the harbor on the other side of the city to, to continue their shipping process wherever they wanted them to go. And so it was a major trade route. It was a bustling city. Um, just outside the city of Corinth was a massive, like, fortress-like rock, and atop that rock was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite to tell you about the number of people coming and going in that city and maybe the spiritual climate of Corinth. Uh, most scholars would tell us that that temple was served by over a thousand prostitutes. A young diverse former slave population. This was not a city that followed Jesus. There wasn't much gospel work there. There wasn't even a great Jewish presence in that city. Um, in the agora or the marketplace there in the city, uh, there's an unusual feature, and it's the number of wells that they see in the marketplace. And again, most scholars tell us that those wells were there to serve the population, to meet the demand that the population had for wine. The city was known for drunkenness and sexual immorality. Um, there, uh, it was a large population of gay and lesbian and transgender sort of people in the city of Corinth. As a matter of fact, it was a regular practice for women to shave their heads and to put on the garb and to enter the arenas to compete as gladiators, as men uh, there in the arena in the games. It was a city full of sexual perversion and immorality and drunkenness. Uh, it was known as the sin city of its day. As a matter of fact, to Corinthianize someone was to corrupt them and to teach them to live in the excesses and the sexual immorality of the city of Corinth. So once again, there were some issues in the city. And Paul was going to write the letter to the Corinthians to address those issues head on. But as we begin today, as Paul always did, this is his pattern throughout all of his letters, before giving them practical things, do this and don't do that, um, Paul's first going to remind them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one thing which unites us, the one thing which is greater than any other thing in this life under which we are all united in Christ Jesus. So look with me in the introduction to Corinthians here in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul introduces himself. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Now, we are not told specifically that this is a Sosthenes from Acts chapter 18. Um, it's likely the same person who is now traveling with Paul. He was the ruler or the leader of the synagogue who had come to faith in Christ. And he's either gone to Paul and said, hey, you got to write us a letter. Things are really ugly in the church. Or he's there as a traveling companion with Paul. But he, he mentions Sosthenes because he would have been familiar to the people in the church at Corinth. And he reminds them of the gospel and just points out three things for them. In verse 2, he writes to the church of God that is in Corinth. To the church of God that is in Corinth. He's reminding them of who they are and what they're there to do. Um, the first thing I want to remind us of, the first thing that Paul reminded them of, is that we are the church of God. Now, our, our context is a little bit different from Corinth. 
Maybe our issues are a little bit different, but we're not all that different, right? We have some issues in our church and our culture, and I believe that if the Apostle Paul could write us a letter today, he would remind us first and foremost of who we are in Christ Jesus. We are the church. That word in the Greek, ekklesia, it means the, the called out ones, or the first and foremost, the gathering of believers, of those who have been called out by Jesus Christ uh, from the old life in which we used to live, now trusting and following after Jesus. We're the ones who are set apart as the church of God in our city. And so he might write to us, to the church of God that is in LaFleur County or wherever you might live. He's reminding us of who we are. The thing that defines our life is not that I'm a, I'm a Potonian. Right? It's not that I'm a Spiroan or wherever you might be from or an Oklahoman or American or any other thing. When people look at our lives, the thing that they ought to see, the thing that should distinguish us is the fact that we are the church of God. We are those who have been called by Jesus Christ. What is true of every single believer in this room is that every one of us is utterly sinful apart from Jesus. And as you look around our church and we're liars, we're thieves, we're adulterers, we're cheaters, and we're, we're men and women who have been boastful and self-righteous and arrogant. We have rebelled against God. Like, you just kind of take a, a poll of, of the, this church. Man, it's a sin of a thousand different flavors. There's no one here who is righteous, who's just like got it right. And God was like, man, he's such a great guy. I think I'm going to save him. Or she's such a great lady. I, I'm going to save her because she's somehow deserving. And as you look across our church, and we are a bunch of people who are hopelessly caught up in our sin, but God. God entered into our story. And in the midst of our sin and our failure and our brokenness, God demonstrated his great love for us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Everyone who is here, a part of this church, every believer in this room, and we were caught up in sin, but we have been saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And y'all, we didn't deserve that. And you might be here today and you're like, man, I've, I've done a lot of things. And I've got a story. I don't know how God could ever save me. Well, the good news is that God is in the business of saving sinners. As a matter of fact, uh, those are the very specific people that Jesus came to seek after. It's the lost. It's the sinful. We are the church of Jesus Christ. It's not our righteousness. It's not our goodness. And it's His. We gather here today under the banner of Jesus Christ, under our common faith in Him. And Paul wants to remind the church of Corinth, hey, this is who you are. And you're not a freed slave. You're not a young hipster in a city called Corinth that's affluent because of all of its trade. And you're the church of Jesus Christ. And he goes on. He says, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. The word sanctified actually means to be made holy. But that's not on our own, is it? Not many of us are holy if you were to look at my life, you wouldn't be like, that guy's holy. Just take the sum of Jason's life. It's not holiness that you see. It's not something that I've done on, our, on my own. It is through faith in Jesus Christ alone that Jesus, there on the cross, he took all of the sin of those of us who have trusted in him, come to faith in Jesus. He took all of our sin. It was placed on the shoulders of Jesus. And there on the cross, Jesus endured the punishment for sin that you and I deserved. And God took that perfect, righteous, holy life of Jesus and he credited that to us. We have been made holy in Christ Jesus. So we are the church of God. And number two, Paul reminds us that we are made holy in him. And there are believers who spend their entire lives walking around carrying the weight of their guilt and their shame. I don't want to go to church this week. It's been a, it's been a rough one. Man, I know what I did this weekend. I know how I failed this week. I don't want to be a part of the church. Listen, we have to remember the gospel. That we're not holy in our own standing, by our own works. We are made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ and faith in Him. We are the church of God. 
and we are made holy in him. And the third thing here is we are called to be disciples. He continues in verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. When he tells us that we're called to be saints, you know what word he uses again? Holy. And so he, he says, um, to the church of God, you are the church. You have been sanctified. You've been made holy in Christ Jesus. But then he reminds us that we, have call, we are called to be holy together with the church in every place. That as the church of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't stop with, Jesus, thank you that you saved me. Thank you that you took my sin and bore my shame. Thank you that you've credited your holiness and righteousness to me. Paul says it goes far beyond that. Jesus didn't die to leave you in a life full of sin where we live just like the rest of our culture, where we totally look just like they do on the outside. Paul says you were called to be holy, to live that out in your life. Your life should be a demonstration of the holiness of Jesus Christ that, that has now been credited to you. And you've, called, you've been called to be holy, to live lives worthy of the gospel that you've received. You know what was normal in Corinth? Sexual immorality, drunkenness, debauchery, divisions, and hauling each other off to court over fights and quarrels that they had about words and business deals. And in Corinth, what was normal was to seek your own, to enrich you and yours, even at the expense of other people. And Paul says, hey, let me remind you, you're not Corinthians. And you're the church of Jesus Christ. That's not your normal and you've been made holy in Jesus Christ, and you have been called to live that holiness out as you walk day by day with Jesus. There's a new normal for us, and Paul's going to write that out for them in this letter, teaching them specifically about the issues that they struggle with. Now, if you're here and you're like, gosh, man, I've, I've tried to be holy, and I've tried to put aside some of those old habits, those old addictions, those old tendencies, but but it's a struggle. And I feel like maybe I can't do it. Or maybe you feel like you're too far gone. Paul continues in giving thanks. He's giving thanks for something that is already true for the people. Um, something that you want to happen, that's what you put on your wish list, right? God, here's what, I'm going to pray for that. God, I want this to happen in me. But Paul is going to thank God for something that has already been done on behalf of the church at Corinth. He says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you are enriched in him. I want you to know today, church, that we're not somehow lacking in something. God is not waiting on us to, you know, that maybe one day he's going to give us more grace and more power, and then we can live in victory. Paul's like, hey, you've been enriched in every way today. You have everything that you need to live out the righteous life in Christ Jesus. You already have it right now. You have been enriched in him in all speech and in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you're not lacking in some gift, like you're not, you're not a, a second-tier Christian because you don't have what other people have. You have been given all of this in Christ Jesus, not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, we included verse 10 in our text this week because he's about to start making some appeals. He's about to call them to unity. That rather than, you know, dividing into groups based upon preferences or politics or whatever it might have been, he's going to call them to unity. But before he did that, he wanted to remind them of the gospel. Remind them that they are the church of God. That they have been made holy in Christ Jesus. And that they were called to to live holy lives in him. The same is true for us. We got 20-something weeks in this book. We're going to walk through each of the verses, um, but we've got to keep the gospel at the forefront. As we address sin and struggles and division and all the things that are coming, we keep the gospel front and center, remembering that even where we failed, we've been made holy by Jesus Christ, and that he's calling us to live out what we already have 
in him. Would you bow with me? Father, we want to praise you for what you're doing in and through this church. We praise you that this is a living church, that people are being saved and baptized and transformed, that families are being transformed by the power of your word and your spirit, that lives are forever being altered. God, we thank you for that. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's difficult. But Lord, we praise you for the work of your spirit among us. Lord, may we keep front and center the gospel of Jesus Christ the hope that we have in you. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue to lead us and make us into the church that you want us to be. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.